In 2006, the state of Michigan enacted a preseason catch and immediate release period for bass during the peak spawning months, allowing fishermen the opportunity to broaden their angling window. Ever since, Lake St. Clair has received an inordinate amount of fishing pressure and Hook and Look Ask Fisheries research biologist Mike Thomas has this scenario left any negative impression on the fishery? From a research standpoint, um, we have not seen any indication that there's been an impact on our recruitment. Um, a lot of bass get caught and immediately released and uh, those fish do have the opportunity to get back down and protect the nest again. Um, or if they're in the guarding the, uh, the, the larval stage, and they can, can get back with those small fish and, and protect them. And so it, based on our trawl surveys where we catch young a year bass in September out here, um, we haven't seen any sign that there's been any big change in the pattern of recruitment. Um, it, it varies and varied before the regulation change and continues to vary after. With some years, uh, a lot of young smallmouth bass in the lake and other years, lower numbers. So it looks to me like we've uh, made a change that has really increased fishing opportunities which benefits the fishermen. It has resulted in what I think is probably a pretty substantial economic benefit to the area here around the lake because so many people are taking advantage of it and coming and fishing here at that time. And uh, at the same time, the, the resource looks like it's really doing well and, and is, um, is in a really good, good state. So I think overall, I have to say that it's been a win-win. Most anglers that visit Lake St. Clair scope out the lake from only one viewpoint, from the deck of their boat. Let us give you a tour of the mile roads from another angle, beginning at a depth of about seven feet. The bottom substrate of the entire area is primarily a combination of sand and marl covered by a thin carpet of cara, better known to anglers as sand grass. Scattered patches of cabbage weed and eelgrasses grow throughout the region as well. And as I maneuver along the landscape, it hardly takes any time at all to come across one of those plethora of beds with an attentive smallmouth on guard duty. Craters are formed when the bed is fanned, thus exposing the silvery white mussel shells, which are typically hidden by the sediment. This is what makes the bed more noticeable from the surface, giving the nest a brighter, more aqua appearance. During my survey, most of the beds I observed were in the latter stages of the spawn. Here is a nest with hundreds of smallmouth fry, no larger than a half an inch long, still located on the bottom. It's likely this brood hatched just a few days prior and will soon begin to swim up off the nest. For that matter, I would say for the most part, the majority of the smallmouth I encountered that were caring for their young were guarding swim up fry. In the bass world, it's the father who instinctively protects and defends his offspring, keeping a close watch and warding off possible threats with an unyielding fortitude. This behavior is what makes these fish so vulnerable and willing to strike a lure at this time. And the proof, or I should say the telltale tracks of the catch and release season were evident in the bruises on the cheeks of many of the smallmouth I came across. I'd also like to bring your attention that as I move shallower towards a depth of five feet, the weeds begin to thicken. I discovered that the long, increasingly dense strands of cabbage and eelgrass harbor a fair population of respectable largemouth, especially in the areas where there was submerged wood present. I stumbled upon an occasional group of dilapidated dock pilings now and then, and each of these structures held largemouth and a population of rock bass. Pumpkin seeds were present as well, and even an occasional crappie would scurry off. From this viewpoint, you can plainly see that Lake St. Clair, more specifically the Mile Roads, appears to be a prolific fish hatchery, especially when it comes to smallmouth bass. But in spite of this, I can't help but have a little concern when taking into consideration that in just a few days, the catch and keep season will begin and several of these guarding males will likely be harvested, pulled away from their parental duties, perhaps prematurely. That's one of the luxuries I have as a scuba diver, is to enter the fish's world, observe, study, 
and personally learn about the fishery. Thank you for taking time to view this video. It's our pleasure to provide you with a underwater perspective of what transpires at Lake St. Clair. In an effort to assist the Natural Resources Commission in making a more informed decision. The previous piece was captured along the mile roads in June of 2013, but by midsummer, for some unexplained reason, the condition of the smallmouth population had taken a turn for the worse. You'll notice the concave bellies in this footage, which were captured in the middle channel in August, a time of year when the fish are typically recovered and fattened up since the spawn. We were also dumbfounded at the lack of gobies and other forage species. This phenomenon was not only puzzling, but a disturbing scenario as well. Anglers who fished the lake later in the season were understandably concerned at what was happening to the fishery. Some contacted the DNR looking for answers, others turned to hook and look for our underwater perspective. Again that summer, Working alongside fisheries biologist Mike Thomas, my son Danny and I dove the center of the lake in search of the schooling lake sturgeon, which I might add was an awesome experience. In lieu of that fact, we ultimately became more concerned in regards to a declining forage base. In two hours, amidst what had typically been productive smallmouth water, we observed an insignificant amount of bait fish and only six bass. We never saw a single round goby and only a few perch, further indicating that an unsettling change was indeed transpiring. As you well know, the weeks during the spawn period are indeed stressful on the fish, from the courtship to the actual spawning ritual. The act is ultimately a significant strain on the fish consuming energy, and taking a toll on both the male and female. The incessant burden of guarding the brood, however, is solely the male's parental responsibility, and it instinctively defends off predators as well as anglers' lures for weeks at all cost, and even on occasion, paying the ultimate price. Fishermen and fisheries biologists can't deny that this is not an uncommon sight along the mile roads during the spawn. A sorrowful vision no matter what the contributing factors are. History has also exhibited that smallmouth tournament mortality is greater in events conducted during the first weekend of the catch and harvest season on Lake St. Clair. Again, due to the amplified stress on the fish at this vulnerable time. Is this a scenario we want to compound day after day during the entire spawn period, which lasts maybe two months at best? I think not. The extended catch and release season seems to be working in a tolerable manner, at least from this point of view. However, your survey exhibiting a reduction in the young of the year smallmouth and a declining forage base over the past two years are a bit discerning and one can't help but wonder if there could be any correlation between the torrent of fishing pressure. Regardless, any catch and immediate release success becomes null and void if you allow anglers the opportunity to repeatedly rip these spawners off their beds, leaving their nests forsaken, never giving their offspring a chance to survive. Do not underestimate the ability of these competitive fishermen. I know. I'm one of them, and each and every one of us would be the first to boast that we have the aptitude to incessantly jerk each and every fish we visually locate off a nest and then relocate them several miles away. In summary, data obtained from your September trawl surveys exhibits a steadily increasing reduction in the young of the year smallmouth bass. Now compound that scenario with a declining forage base then irresponsibly expose these spawning bass to an unnecessary amount of fish harvest during their most vulnerable stage. And I assure you, in just a matter of time, we'll be reporting on the collapse of an illustrious smallmouth fishery.